Well, thank you for coming um, tonight. I was going to say coming out on such a cold evening, but we're all sitting at home bundled, hopefully nice and warm. Uh, this is a beginning level genealogical presentation. And even if you are an experienced family historian, you may find the families in my case studies interesting. So why are people interested in their family roots? Well, some people want to connect themselves to early European settlers, like the ones who came on the Mayflower. In years past, they believed their ancestral backgrounds conferred some special status on themselves. Others with more recent immigrant ancestors want to understand the culture their family came from and to learn about the journey that took them to America. We hope to preserve our family history for future generations. As Paul Tsongas said, we are a continuum. Just as we reach back to our ancestors for fundamental values, so we, as guardians of that legacy, must reach ahead to our children and their children. And we do so with a sense of sacredness in that reaching. Whether your family came from Ireland, Italy, Canada, Armenia, China, or arrived on the Mayflower in 1620, all people start genealogical research in the same way. You begin with yourself, your parents, your brothers and sisters, your grandparents, and you work your way back in time. In this lecture, I will illustrate the journey of discovery with the histories of three families, the Conleys, the Arigos, and the Barneses, and a former enslaved man, Perio Bumpu. Two of the individuals were connected with the Waltham Historical Society, Michael Conley and Mary Barnes. Another, Placido Arrigo, purchased the Barnes property and farmed it until the death of uh, Mary Barnes, after the death of Mary Barnes. And Perio Bumpu lived in the Trapelo district in the 18th century. We will look at the beginning steps, how to access records, and how to work your way back in time. A good way to begin research is by filling out a pedigree or ancestor chart, going back as far as you can. By the way, you could, if you just Google pedigree chart, you'll find zillions of, the, of them that you can download. You start by filling in your own name in the number one position here, and then your parents, father number two, mother number three, um, and then your uh, grandparents. Uh, be sure to fill in their dates of birth, marriage, and death, as well as the places where these events took place. And so you may not be able to do all of this yourself. So you want to talk to your older relatives and to go through the old family photos with your family uh, gathered around the dinner table. Another important genealogical document is the family group sheet. In this one, you fill in the parents' names at the top, um, and then you list all the children. Genealogy is an avocation that dates to uh, biblical times, and people have been researching family trees without computers for centuries. Uh, these two documents that I mentioned here, the pedigree chart and the family group sheet, are the basic documents of recording your family history. But now, genealogical software creates the charts for us, and we just input the data. So uh, many people here remember Mr. Shea, the art teacher at Waltham Public Schools. I went to the Lawrence School and we were always look forward to the days when Mr. Shea would come to teach art for us, to us. We loved him. He was young and enthusiastic and we enjoyed his lessons. So I'm going to trace his ancestry. Paul Shea was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1925, and he was the son of Casimir Shea, 
and Rosemary Conley. He grew up in Watertown and his father was an art teacher also. Paul Shea joined the US Navy during World War II and he was aboard one of the ships that took part on the, in the D-Day invasion. He graduated from Massachusetts College of Art in 1950. And in that year, he began teaching art in Waltham. He became the director of the art department in Waltham and retired in 1984. But he continued with his love of art after retirement and many people in Waltham have his paintings. Uh, this painting uh, below here is of the bank school. Uh, it's by Mr. Shea. I still call him Mr. Shea because that's what we did in school. Um, and uh, it's the bank school. Um, and we also have a couple of other of his paintings um, over at our archives at the Bright School. So let's start looking at uh, the... Uh, where uh, a place where we can start, which would be the 1940 census records on ancestry. And we're looking for Paul Shea board 1925. And I should just uh, um, say that the um, release of uh, the 1950 census is imminent. Um, and so uh, for the first time, some of us will actually be able to see ourselves in the census. Um, but also that will be very helpful. Um, so, uh, so here we are with the 1940 census and Paul Shea is living in Watertown, Massachusetts with his parents, Casimir and Rose Shea. He's 14 years old in 1940 and he had been born in Massachusetts. So here's a close up of the image. Uh, we will be focusing our research on his mother Rose today. We see that she was uh, 40 years old in 1940. So she, and she had been born in Massachusetts. So Rose was born around 1900 then. Here they are in the, so we're working our way back in time um, in the census records. And the census records were taken every 10 years starting in 1790. Um, the only thing is the 1890 census was destroyed in a fire. Uh, so here they are uh, in 1930 in Watertown. Each census asked different questions. In 1930, it asked, do you own or rent your do domicile? And if you did own it, how much was the house worth? Casimir and Rose owned their house at 219 Common Street in Watertown and it was worth $12,000. It also asked, where were your parents born? Rose said that her father was born in Massachusetts and her mother was born in Canada. Rose said she was 30 years old, which would place again her date of birth around 1900. That being said, I should mention, especially with my Irish ancestors, they were, their date of birth varied with every single census. So, um, uh, and so that's one of the things you have to take it, that information uh, with a, a, a little bit of um, a leeway. So one of the things, your next step could be is to look for the marriage records. So we saw in the census that the oldest child in 1930 was eight years old. So Casimir and Rose must have married eight to 10 years previously. We could go onto a website called familysearch.org, I should say, and search for Massachusetts Vital Records to 1920. They have them free online. So uh, Casimir and Rose were married in Waltham on November 6th, uh, 1920. Marriage records are an important source of uh, information, uh, especially in Massachusetts, because the records frequently list the names of the parents of the bride and groom. And the information uh, on the marriage record is reliable since the facts are coming from the bride and groom who are saying, these are my parents. 
So we see that the parents of Rose were Michael J. Conley and Mary Slavin. So now we're back another generation. This is always a, 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 a cause for celebration among genealogists to get back another generation. Also, note that the name uh, down the bottom here, the name of the informant on it is, was the priest who married them. And his name was Arthur T. Connolly of Jamaica Plain. So he's not a priest at St. Mary's, even though the wedding was probably conducted at St. Mary's. So you have to ask yourself, who is this Arthur T. Connolly? Um, he must be a relative or maybe a relative. And so you need to research this um, as well. In the mid, the mid to uh, late 19th century, there was a lot of under-registration in civil vital records. Children were born at home and it was up to the parents to report the birth. For Mary, and I should mention, by the way, that in the city of Boston, because under-reporting was so prevalent that they actually went door to door every six months asking what children had been born there in the previous six months. Uh, but in places like Waltham, they just relied on the parents uh, to report the births. For marriages, the informant was the priest, minister, justice of the peace, or town clerk who married them. Sometimes the clergy were remiss in turning in the paperwork. The informants for death records were undertakers who sometimes were also remiss in turning in reports. In immigrant populations, especially ones that came from countries where they had been oppressed by the government, the immigrants were reluctant to cooperate with American officials. Church records can help compensate for this underreporting. Catholics believed that babies who died before they were baptized would go to limbo. So newborns were usually baptized within a couple of days of birth. Church records can also extend the network of relatives in your family tree. The godparents at baptisms and the witnesses at marriages were often the friends and relatives from the old country. If you hit a brick wall in your research, you can investigate these collateral lines to get over this brick wall. The archives of the Archdiocese of Boston has the 19th and early 20th century parish registers for most of the churches in the Archdiocese, including the ones for Waltham. And these also have been digitized and are available online at AmericanAncestors.org. And uh, I should say that you do not have to be a member of the New England Historic Genealogical Society to to look at the Catholic parish registers online there. Um, and they, these registers also include the registers for St. Mary's. So we saw previously that the father of Rose Conley Shea was Michael J. Conley and that she married in Waltham. Michael Joseph Conley was one of the first directors of the Waltham Historical Society when we organized in 1913. He maintained an interest in history, and he read a paper on the history of the area lawyers at a meeting of the uh, Waltham Historical Society in 1923. He himself was a lawyer and maintained practices in Waltham and in the Ames Building on Court Street in Boston. He later became a judge in the Waltham District Court and rose to the position of Chief Justice of the Waltham District Court. He was very interested in the Waltham Public Library and he spent many a day at the library. He was the chairman of the Board of Trustees for the library for many years. Michael J. Conley has many well-known descendants, including his son, Judge Paul Conley of the Waltham District Court, his grandson, Paul Shea, artist and art director of the Waltham Public Schools. Uh, his grandson, Michael J. Conley, 
former Massachusetts Secretary of State, his great grandson, John Conley, who ran for mayor of Boston against Marty Walsh, and his great grandson, Joe Vizard, who is the Waltham City Clerk. Our next step is to look for Rose Conley uh, before she was married. Uh, and she married in November of 1920. Um, and here she is in the 1920 census in Waltham. Uh, and she's living with her parents, Michael and Mary, at 24 Church Street. So here they are, the close up of that. And here's Rose. Uh, her father, Michael, was 55 years old and had been born in Massachusetts. His parents had been born in Ireland. The 1920 census asks immigrants, when did you arrive in America and how long have you been here? And when did you become a naturalized citizen? Mary had been born in Canada. And this state, she, was, she immigrated in 1897, but you'll see in another census, she said 18, I think it's 81. She became a naturalized citizen though in 1897, uh, but this was her marriage date. So women didn't uh, ordinarily become naturalized citizens. Um, and, and if they married a, a, an American, uh, they automatically became a citizen through marriage. So we can estimate then Michael's birth date as around 1865 and their marriage date as 1897. A thorough genealogist would also look up the birth record of not only Rose, but all of her siblings. But for the sake of brevity, we're going to jump to our next step. So now we start working our way back in time in the census records. Here is Michael and Mary Conley at 13 Pine Street in Waltham um, in 1900. And so the census of that year asks, how long have you been married? How many children have you had? And how many are still living? They, so uh, Michael and Mary had been married for three years and they had two children, both of whom were living. In this census, Mary said that she had emigrated in 1881 and had been in America for 19 years. So our next step is to locate the 1897 marriage of Michael Conley and Mary Slavin. They, it turns out they were married in 1897 in Napanee, Ontario, but the marriage record was also recorded in Waltham. So uh, Mary Slavin had been born in Canada um, and actually it shows that she was born in Napanee, Ontario. So, but what happens is that oftentimes marriages are recorded in both the bride and the groom's hometowns. And if they're two different places, then they're actually recorded twice in two different places as well. So we have the Waltham marriage record and it shows that uh, Mike, the parents of Michael Conley were Stephen Conley and Ann Dyer. So now we're back another generation. So now we're gonna look for Michael Conley before he was married and we're looking for him living with his parents. The 1870 census can be useful because it shows the citizenship status of immigrants. And that's way over on the right hand uh, column, there's a checkoff uh, uh, block uh, to, to show if you are a US citizen and could vote. And so what we see is that Stephen Conley um, Michael's father uh, was a U.S. citizen in uh, 1970. Also, the Conleys moved to Beverly from between 1865 and 1870. Indeed, Michael's obituary uh, said that he had graduated from Beverly High School. 
1870 census shows that Stephen was a citizen, so he must have naturalized before 1870. Also, notice living with the family, there is a 69-year-old Mary Conley. Uh, so one of the things you want to ask is, what's her relationship? Is, he, is she Stephen's mother? The census shows that Stephen owned also uh, here, these two columns. The first one here asks, what is the value of the, your real estate? And for him, it was $3,000. And the, the other column is, what is the value of your personal estate? And this is worth $1,000. So Stephen was doing pretty well for himself. Citizenship documents, especially naturalization petitions and declarations of intent, can be very useful in determining the place of origin of an immigrant ancestor. In Massachusetts, the documents often detail the date and place of birth and the date and port of entry into the United States. We saw in the 1870 census that Stephen Conley was a citizen. So let's look for his naturalization record. Here we can see the index to the New England naturalization petitions. Um, and these are available on Ancestry and at familysearch.org. We find the index record for Stephen and it shows that he was naturalized in the US Circuit Court of Boston um, in uh, 1853 um, and it also says that uh, the record can be found in volume five, page 390. So that enables us to go look for his rec actual record. So uh, one of the things a lot of people uh, miss is that the naturalization records are actually a, a very often a two and sometimes three page document. Uh, the 19th and early 20th century New England naturalization petitions are searchable on Ancestry and they're browsable on the familysearch.org. Some important clues that people miss are the names of the witnesses. And here we see on the right that there's a Thomas Conley of Boston was listed as a witness. So could he be related? Here is the close-up, um, and it shows that Stephen Conley had been born on the 21st of December in 1829 in Galway, and that he had arrived in Boston on June 27th, 1848. But remember the witness, Thomas Conley? It turns out, so here he is, the, the witness listed, along with a Dominic O'Brien. Uh, it turns out that Thomas Conley was Stephen's brother. Um, and the Arthur T. Conley that we saw the priest who had married Casimir Shea and Rose Conley, he was the son of Thomas Conley and Arthur had been born in Waltham in 1853. So we look for Thomas Conley's naturalization record. The document says that Thomas Conley, now of Waltham and formerly of Boston, had been born on December 18th, 1825 in what's listed as Rinville County Galway. So now we have an exact place. And Thomas arrived in Boston on May 27th, 1847. So one of the things we see is, is that Thomas, first of all, is older than Michael, uh, Stephen. Um, and secondly, he came over before Stephen did also. He came in 1847, which is the year of the, uh, the Great Famine, uh, the, what they call Black 47. So the family often uh, uh, immigrates in a chain uh, fashion so that some of the older kids come over first and start working and earning some money and they send money back to bring the rest of the family over. 
Stephen moved to Beverly, Massachusetts between 1865 and 1870. He died in Salem in 1900, and his death record, which is shown here, stated that the names of his parents were Gregory Conley and Mary Haney. So his mother was named Mary. So she must have been the older Mary that was living with them in 1870. Uh, so, and here is the close up showing the names of uh, Stephen's parents, Gregory Conley and Mary Haney. Likewise, Thomas died in Waltham uh, in 1876, and his death record said his parents were Gregory and Mary also. So therefore, Stephen and Thomas Conley were brothers. Newspapers can be great sources of information about our ancestors, particularly in showing the relationships in families in obituaries but they also shed light on the everyday lives of our ancestors. Now many newspapers are every word searchable, making the possibility of finding a lot of information much, great, uh, much greater. The Waltham News Tribune is a wonderful source about everyday life in Waltham, and it's on microfilm in the Waltham Public Library. Waltham newspapers, uh, can go back to the 1850s, like the Waltham Sentinel. And the earliest ones have been digitized and are available on a subscription website called Genealogy Bank. The Boston Globe, uh, which started in 1872, is available online. Um, if you have a Waltham Public Library card, you can access the Boston Globe uh, from home uh, via the library's website. The Cambridge Public Library has digitized historic uh, Cambridge newspapers from 1846 to 1947. And these are available free online as well. You do not need a Cambridge Public Library card uh, to access them. Um, I, and I should also mention that the Belmont Public Library has also digitized their newspapers. And again, you can um, get, uh, access those online and you don't need a, a Boston, a, a Belmont Public Library card to get them. So Genealogy Bank, a subscription uh, uh, newspaper database has some of the Beverly newspapers. And I was able to find quite a few articles mentioning the Conleys, including an obituary for Stephen Conley, and in which it says that he was uh, uh, one of, he was the father of the Conley brothers uh, who were well-known contractors um, in Beverly Farms. And actually the Conley Construction Company built most of those big mansions in Pride's Crossing. Um, so the family, the Conleys, were actually very prominent in Beverly. Um, and uh, so, uh, and it mentions that all of his relatives, including his son, uh, Michael, um, and uh, Thomas. So, um, and also it says that uh, one of them, uh, Stephen, was a Commodore of the Beverly Yacht Club. So that's why I said we're talking about really upper middle class uh, Irish American family here. And it also mentions that his son Michael was a lawyer. And Michael, by the way, had uh, by that time had located to Waltham um, uh, where his, uh, he was in practice uh, as a lawyer. This is the marriage announcement for uh, uh, Stephen's daughter. And the marriage announcement mentions several cousins of the bride, um, including, a, by the way, Arthur T. Uh, uh, Conley was the uh, priest. Um, and it also mentions several cousins, including uh, others on the mother's side of the family, like the Dyers in South Boston. Also attending the wedding were five priests, 
So this gives you an idea of how big, uh, you know, important this Conley family was. So I traced the location of Gregory Conley, who was the uh, parent of Stephen, uh, in the uh, Griffiths Valuation, which is a mid 19th century, so circa 1850, uh, land occupiers census substitute. And I tra uh, trace them to the town land uh, of Gortina Glock, uh, which is uh, located adjacent to the village of Tully and near the uh, town of Renville. So here we have, again, Gregory Conley's uh, in the Renville area. Now, there were actually two Gregory Conley's in this 283 acre townland. So a townland is the smallest unit of geography in Ireland. Um, and there often are only a few hundred acres. So one of the Gregory's lived on lot number four. The lots are listed over on the left-hand side. And the other one was on lot number 15. It also mentions that their houses were worth 10 shillings. Um, and each of them was on three or four acres of land. Now, I should mention that three or four acres of land at the time of the famine was not enough to sustain a family. Um, so, and not only that, but the average three room thatched roof cottage that you see all the time with the center uh, room being the living room, kitchen, um, and the two bedrooms, one for the parents and one for the children on either side. That type of house was worth 15 shillings. So what you can see is that uh, the, both of them were living in less smaller houses than that. So now we link up to actual maps that show the lot numbers. And here we have, okay, wait a minute, let's do that again. Here we have lot number four and lot number 15 in the townland of Gortina Glock. So we could actually then go on to Google uh, Maps and actually look at the current day um, image and also go on to Google Street View, which is what I did and found actually the house of uh, lot number 15 of Gregory Conley. Um, and as I mentioned, Google Street View has been all over Ireland. So in these days of uh, COVID, where we're not able to travel, one of the ways you can kind of vicariously uh, visit Ireland is on Google Street View. In the 20th century, genealogists have more resources available since record keeping was more detailed and the records are more likely to have survived. Jewish genealogy faces some of the same hurdles as Irish since uh, the Jewish people have common surnames, uh, they were persecuted in the old country and they were coming from very disturbed areas. Nevertheless, many people with Eastern European roots have successfully traced their family history to the old country. French Canadian genealogy, uh, especially for people, uh, I shouldn't say for um, Acadians, but for people with Quebec roots, it's in my opinion, ridiculously easy um, since the church records for Quebec date back to the 17th century and they, these church records are available online on Ancestry.com. I've had people uh, walked into the Hisgen and um, said their in ancestor's name was so-and-so, LeBlanc, let's say. Um, and within a half an hour, we're back, we were back to the 17th century for them. Italian genealogy, especially for families coming from Southern Italy, and Sicily is also fairly easy since the civil registration records date back to the early 19th century and many of those have been digitized. 
okay, wait a minute, we're jumping ahead here. So uh, here we see the farm of Placido Arrigo, an Italian immigrant who lived at uh, 244 Warren Street in Waltham. This was, is a 380 year old farm now owned by the city of Waltham. American military records are often very useful to genealogists since the military tended to keep detailed records. And these have been preserved by state archives and federal government as well. During World War I and World War II, a draft was instituted for men between the ages of 18 and 40. And here we see the World War II draft registration for Placido Arrigo. And, uh, this, it shows that uh, his place of birth was Saponara, uh, Italy. And it also shows that his date of birth was January 5th, 1896. While well, 19th century uh, passenger lists can be a little bit helpful, but oftentimes if they have very common names, you don't know if the Patrick O'Brien that you're looking on a ship is actually your Patrick O'Brien. But um, in the 20th century, passenger lists can be a gold mine. They list the name of the immigrant, their age, birthplace, next of kin in the old country, their American contacts, their ultimate destination, how much money they were carrying, their height, complexion, hair color and eye color. And here we see the 1913 passenger arrival list uh, for um, who came by the way, for Placido Arrigo, who came on the Saxonia um, it, from uh, Messina, Italy. And uh, moving closer, we see that here he is, uh, that his last residence was a Saponara in Messina, near Messina, Italy, and that his next of kin was his father, Giovanni uh, Arrigo, and that uh, his destination uh, was Boston. So, so we now we're back another generation in Italy for uh, Placido Arrigo. His father was Giovanni. And I should just mention, by the way, that Placido's, Placido had only one son. He had all daughters if, uh, otherwise. And he named that son John. Um, so he must have named him for his father. Saponara, Italy was uh, a hamlet adjacent to Villa Franca and it was located near Messina um, at the tip of Sicily, across from the toe of Italy. It was located up in the mountains between Villa Franca and Messina. And it currently has a population of a little over 4,000. And this is a photo from Wikipedia showing the main church in Saponara. So it makes you want to go to visit. The civil registration records for Southern Italy and Sicily were very good, very detailed, and they are available through the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. And also you can access them online at a local branch family history center, and in some cases from your home computer. Many of the, uh, the local branch history uh, centers are closed because of COVID. But you can also access the computer records at the Lexington Public Library. Here we see uh, the Family History Library's holdings for Saponara, and it shows that the births, marriages, and deaths from 1824 to 1910 are available to view um, online from your home computer. And here is the birth record of Placido Arrigo. And it shows that he was born at 1400, at 14 hours and 15 minutes or 2.15 PM 
on January 5th, 1896, and that his parents were Caterina Sacca de Placido and Giovanni Arrigo de Santi. So the amazing thing is that this record not only lists his parents, but also his grandparents. Um, and even more amazing is that we were able to go right to the date Placido was born to find his birth record. So, uh, so what they, so in other words, uh, his parents were Katerina Saka, and she was the daughter of Placido Saka, and Giovanni, uh, the father Giovanni Arrigo, uh, was the son of Santi Arrigo. So you can get back into, uh, in some cases, the late 18th century in Italian records. I have done that with my sister-in-law. An early inhabitant of the house at 244 Warren Street was Mary Barnes. Um, and she was an early member of the Waltham Historical Society since its inception in 1913. And uh, she remained a, me uh, a member until her death in 1922. She wrote a history of her ancestors, the Barnes and Warren families, and her nephew, Frank L. Barnes, uh, read the paper at the society meeting in 1919. The farm here dates back to perhaps 1632, when John Warren purchased the lot for his son, Daniel Warren. The city of Waltham purchased the farm with CPA funds and has been using the land as a tree farm. Mary Barnes was born in Waltham on October 29th, 1834. And it jumped ahead on me. Okay. Uh, and she was the daughter. Nope, it's going the wrong way. Okay, here we go. She was the daughter of Thomas Barnes and his wife, Adeline Lawrence. She was a school teacher and she taught in Boston and then later at the North Grammar School in Waltham. And she never married. She died on May 2nd, 1922 in Waltham where she had been living at the old family homestead on Warren Street. The two records shown here are the list of deaths that were reported in Waltham city directories. This was compiled by the library staff and is available online. The other record is an obituary from the Cambridge Chronicle, which again is available online on the Cambridge Public Library website. City directories can be great sources of information for genealogists. They usually list all of the working adults in a household, their occupations and places of business, and the residents. So when I say working adults, what that means is not only do they list parents, but also some of the older children um, who are out working. <coughs> For marriages, the informant is often the priest or minister who married the couple. So we could have then looked up Arthur T. Conley, but he actually performed the marriage in Waltham. But we can look up, in other cases, you have a particular, like in Boston, you're trying to figure out what church did they attend. You can look up the address of the priest in city directories and figure out what church he was at in the year of that marriage. The directory here shows that uh, Mary F. Barnes uh, was a teacher um, in the North Grammar School and lived at the same address as Phineas L. Barnes, who turned out to be her brother. And Phineas was named actually Phineas Lawrence Barnes um, after his grandfather. So let's look at the 1870 census when Mary would have been 36 years old. And here we see Mary F. Barnes, age 35. She's living with an older woman named Adeline, most likely her mother. 
Um, and the dwelling number is the number in the first column um, on the left. And uh, I should point out, by the way, that there's uh, over uh, time, uh, streets in Waltham have become renumbered. So you can't always go by the actual number of the dwelling on the census. So here we see that, uh, so the dwelling number is this first column and the next column is the family number. So what we see here is that Adeline owns thir uh, real estate of $13,000. Um, and she's living uh, with her daughter, Mary. Um, and also in the same house is another family and that's the family of Phineas Barnes. Um, so, uh, so that's one thing. You, and what you want to do is if you see people, you know, there are two or three family houses all over the Boston area. So you always want to consider who are the other people in the same dwelling? Um, are they friends and relatives from the old country, the neighbors? So let's move back another 10 years to see this family in an earlier time. Here we see Mary. Uh, age 25 years old, and she's living with an older couple, Thomas and Adeline. Uh, Thomas is 72 years old and Adeline is 58. So this places the birth of Thomas in about 1788. The census indicates the value of their real estate at $7,000 and personal estate at 2,000. This information uh, suggests that looking for probates and deeds uh, might be uh, useful as well. So whenever you see that uh, uh, real estate being listed uh, in a, a census, uh, like the, in the 1860 or 70 census, you wanna start looking around for probates and deeds. Massachusetts started be, uh, collecting vital records on a statewide basis in 1841, but most towns collected vital records from their founding. Most of these records have been published in book form, including ones for Waltham. Uh, this book um, on the right here, this uh, page was taken from the book, Waltham Vital Records to 1850. And here we see the Barnes births and it's showing the birth of Mary Francis uh, daughter of Thomas and Adeline in 1834. It also lists Phineas Lawrence Barnes um, in, uh, born in 1828. Uh, there is also another useful for uh, people uh, with Waltham roots uh, in Watertown also. Uh, there's another useful book called by, written by Henry Bond called Genealogies of the families and descendants of the early settlers of Watertown, Mass. And just remember that Waltham and Weston were originally part of Watertown. So what we're looking at here is the entry for Daniel Warren, um, uh, who is the was the builder of a house uh, on Warren Street, which is now at uh, not the same house. So he built a house around 1650. Um, and then Thomas uh, Barnes uh, tore it down and built a house in 1837. So Bond probably accessed a lot of his information from the parish registers for the first parish church in Waltham. He also may have looked at gravestone inscriptions. Uh, this is, as, as I mentioned, uh, an entry for Daniel uh, Warren, um, uh, who lived on the farm on Warren Street. So probate records, uh, those are uh, records of wills, administrations, and guardianships uh, could be extremely useful for all sorts of reasons. They can show relationships among families, since the next of kin are often listed. They could show um, uh, personal inventories, which give us a glimpse into the everyday lives of people uh, who lived in a much different era. The real estate inventories help us trace 
the history of the land and the houses in our community. And they give us an idea of how the land was used for farming. <clears throat> the Middlesex probate original papers up to 1871 are available online on AmericanAncestors.org, which is the website of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. If you don't have a subscription, you may be able to access this through um, your local public library. Thomas Barnes, the father of Mary Barnes, died in 1861, and he left a very detailed will. He left Mary $50 a year for five years, provided that she made the Warren Street house her home with her mother, and provided that she remain unmarried. He also gave her his pianoforte. He later wrote a codicil saying that should the mother die and Mary remained unmarried, he gave her the use of the west wing of the house, consisting of 10 rooms, the house I think consisted of 10 rooms, two chambers, woodshed, a cellar, and all of the privileges belonging to them with the right to pass to and from uh, at all times. But in the case, if, if she married or she died, then all of it would go to PL or Phineas Lawrence Barnes. So Nathaniel Bowman uh, lived just over the line in West Cambridge, um, which is now um, part of Belmont. Um, and he died in 1747. In his will, he specified that his quote, Negro man, end of quote, Pero uh, was to be freed upon the death of Bowman's wife, Anne. Ann Bowman died 10 years later in 1757. And three weeks after she died, the newly emancipated Perio Bumpu married Sarah Toby. But Perio Bumpu died four years later, leaving his pregnant wife and his son, Micah. Perio Bumpu was a leather dresser and he likely lived in the Trapolo district probably up around in the uh, area of Forest Street. He left a will in which he appointed Nathaniel Bridge, who was Bowman's uh, son-in-law, and Josiah Brown as executors. Now, Nathaniel Bridge lived in what later became the Metropolitan State Hospital. Um, and Josiah Brown uh, lived on land that later became the Doty estate. Um, and so these two were listed as executors. So you have to ask yourself, why did uh, the, um, uh, were they appointed executors? And it could be because Perio lived around and perhaps worked for them as well. So probate records often include a list of the heirs um, and the inventories of real estate and personal estate. By the time the estate was probated, uh, Perio's wife, Sarah, had given birth to their second son, Perio. He was named Perio, the son. Josiah Brown, who lived along Forest Street, was named guardian of the two children. And on the right, we see a list of items in Perio Bumpu's personal estate. It documents his clothes, furniture, kitchen implements, and tools. It also lists books and a Bible. So I think we could conclude that Perio Bumpu was a literate, was literate, not. Uh, maps and land records can be very useful to genealogists. Maps can place our family at specific times within certain neighborhoods. On the left, this is an 1875 map showing the farm of P.L. Barnes on Warren Street. 
there are a number of maps now posted on the Waltham Historical Commission website, including the 1875 map. For other towns, uh, you can check out the Norman Leventhal Map Center, the Massachusetts State Library, and the Library of Congress. And I should also mention there's a very useful uh, 1854 Woodford map, which is available in high resolution on the Harvard University uh, uh, Library website. So Massachusetts deeds to 1900 have been digitized and they are also available as browsable images on familysearch.org website. I use this site frequently to research the history of properties in Waltham. For post-1870 deeds, you could also check the Middlesex Land Registry online. Most of the deeds that are searchable uh, on their website only go back to 1970s or 80s. But when you bring up those 1970s and 80s deeds, it will mention the grantor's title with the book and page number. You can then use the uh, Massachusetts Land Registry website to look up the book and the page to get to the earlier deeds. Uh, but they run out about eight, um, 1870, and that's where you then have to flip over to the uh, Family History Library uh, website to access those. And those deeds go back, well, I think Middlesex um, County was organized around 1640. Um, and I should mention, though, also some of the earliest uh, Waltham deeds are in the Suffolk County uh, Land Registry. Um, because before Middlesex County was formed. And the Suffolk County uh, deeds have been um, printed in book form and are searchable. They also are indexed. So on the right, we have an eight, 1781 deed showing the transfer of land uh, at 244 uh, Warren Street from the Warrens to the brother-in-law, Samuel Barnes, who was the father of Thomas Barnes. Local histories are also indispensable to genealogists since many will state the history of our families. So oftentimes they have what we refer to as a mug book um, in the back sections where they have uh, genealogies of the, uh, the local families. That being said, you wanna take that information with a grain of salt. So among the better local histories are the Waltham Rediscovered, um, the, uh, the Waltham, uh, History of Waltham by Charles Nelson, and uh, the History of Waltham as a Precinct of Watertown and as a Town by Edmund Sanderson. Sanderson was an excellent historian and the Waltham Historical Society has many of his papers. Um, this sketch on the right uh, links the Warren family to the Barnes family through the marriage of Samuel Barnes, a sea captain from Newfoundland and Grace Warren, uh, the daughter of Phineas Warren and the great granddaughter of Daniel Warren. Sanderson mentions that Mary Barnes was the last descendant of John Warren to live on the land on Warren Street. So he, Sanderson probably knew Mary Barnes because um, they both were uh, involved in the early stages of the um, Waltham Historical Society. These books are available at the Waltham Public Library um, and many uh, like Nelson's book written in 1879 are available online. Archival records are original records that have never been published and they are unique. They could be diaries, letters, photographs, business records, account books, um, and et cetera. You can search for archival records on the OCLC website, Archive Grid. I find it uh, very interesting on Archive Grid to just type in the word Waltham and see what comes up. There are many items 
listed in there on from the Waltham Public Library archives. Uh, my search also uncovered a business ledger of Thomas Barnes at the Library of Historic New England. Their library is located on Cambridge Street in Boston. The Waltham Historical Society has a number of items pertaining to the Barnes family, including the diary of Phineas L. Barnes, the brother of Mary Barnes. And uh, the, there's an entry here um, on the right of, for Phineas Barnes from his diary. Um, and then also on the left, we have an 1819 invitation to a ball for Thomas Barnes. And here we have a photograph of Adeline Lawrence Barnes, the wife of Thomas Barnes and mother of Mary Barnes. Um, so, uh, and she's daughter of um, uh, Phineas Lawrence. Many people uh, have written their family history and either published it or deposited it in a library. These could be very useful in steering us in certain directions. If they are well written, they could be cited as sources for our own family research. But you need to evaluate the research carefully. Do their conclusions make sense? Did they cite their sources? Are they just repeating other people's research that might be incorrect? The same thing goes for family trees on the internet. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Look for family histories that use primary sources, such as census records and vital records. This excerpt uh, comes from a very good uh, uh, compiled genealogy um, that and it pertains to John Warren and his son Daniel, and it's well researched and cites its sources. And here we have the genealogy of the descendants of the Barnes family from Newfoundland, which is available at the Waltham Historical Society and the Waltham Public Library. Um, it, it has an interesting story about how Captain Samuel Barnes met Grace Warren through her sister and brother-in-law. A lot of people have been rushing to learn about their family history by having their DNA tested. And I have to say, I'm one of them, and I have found a huge amount of information and got back on my family trees. But I did it because I was able to integrate the DNA uh, matches with my already historical research. There are two reasons that people want to see uh, to uh, have their DNA tested. One is to see what their ethnicity mix is. The other is to try to identify their ancestors by looking for DNA matches. But as I mentioned, you also need to do the historical research if you're gonna make any sense of your matches. There are three types of DNA testing. Y DNA, which traces paternal ancestry. Uh, and it asks basically, who was your father's 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 father? Um, why DNA matches, uh, the matches that you get, uh, you would share a common patrilineal ancestor. The test can uncover a y, uh, the male's Y chromosome haplogroup, which is the ancient group of people from whom one's patrilineage descends. Only one company does Y DNA tests, family tree DNA in Houston. So, and only males can, because only males have Y DNA, only males can do this test. So if you're a female, you have to uh, recruit a brother or your father or an uncle or a male cousin. I suggest starting with a 37 marker uh, test. And then if you do get close matches, you can upgrade to 11, 111 markers. The big Y 700 marker tests can bring your ancestry back into the Middle Ages. And I've done that with the uh, Daly line um, who descend from poets um, in County Cork. Mitochondrial DNA tests uh, for your maternal ancestors 
And so they're asking, who was your mother's 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 mother? Uh, these tests uh, can go also go back for cent in centuries, but they're less commonly ordered. The autosomal DNA tests for it tests for all of your ancestors, but it can only go back about four or five generations. Ancestry, family tree DNA, 23andMe, and my heritage all do autosomal DNA tests, and both males and females can do the test. So a lot of people are interested in their ethnicity, and but these tests can be dubious at best. And I should mention that my uh, ethnicity mix has changed over time with ancestry, um, and it doesn't always match what I already know about in the historical records. Um, so uh, I would say that's of least interest. There's another free website where you can upload your DNA results, and that is a, a free website called GEDmatch. To summarize my points tonight, uh, start with your family uh, search for your family roots with yourself, your parents, and your grandparents. Fill in a pedigree chart and interview relatives. Go back through the old family photos with them. To start your research, begin with the census records, vital records, and church records, and work your way back in time. Then look for probates, uh, records of wills, administrations, deeds, and maps. Try to place your ancestor in the context of his or her community. For 19th and 20th century immigrants, look for naturalization records and passenger arrival lists. Search online military records, such as uh, draft registrations and Civil War and Revolutionary War service records and pension records. Consult uh, compiled genealogies and local histories to see if someone has already researched your family. And finally, you should integrate the results of your DNA tests uh, with historical research to make any sense of the DNA tests. So uh, one thing I would want to mention before uh, we uh, end our session tonight is that there is a huge uh, family history uh, conference coming up. It's free. There are over 1,500 online sessions. Um, it's called Roots Tech. They've now opened for registrations. The uh, conference um, occurs uh, from March 3rd through March 5th, in, uh, coming up in 2022. So I highly recommend checking this out because it could be that your ancestor wasn't among the Irish, Italian, um, and uh, English ancestors that I mentioned today, uh, but there is likely to be ones on French Canadian, Acadians, there's, there was even one on uh, Polynesian ancestry. So, uh, so it's well worth checking out. So we're gonna um, end with a picture of uh, Gregory Conley's house in County Galway. And we could take any uh, questions and answers at this point. So I'm gonna stop the screen share. Thank you so much, Marie, that was wonderful. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask questions, or you can type them into the chat and I can relay them. Um, and also, I'll just mention again that the syllabus for this talk is on our website, and there is a link to the syllabus on our website in the chat room. I have a question, Marie. What does um, autosomal mix mean? It just means all of the, um, I, I'm not, I should mention that I'm not an expert on DNA. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and as, as we speak, by the way, I have a book uh, near me um, on DNA testing, uh, which is by Blaine Bettinger. So I would recommend mm -hmm. that. 
Um, but the, the autosomal tests um, cover uh, not only uh, the male and female uh, lines, but all of the lines in between. Um, and uh, so each, so each of us inherits approximately 50% of our DNA from one, 50% uh, from our father, 50% from our mother. Mm -hmm. So then for your parents, they also inherited 50% from their parents. But what we get from our grandparents then is only 25%. Mm -hmm. And then from our great grandparents, we only have 12 and a half percent. And from our great great grandparents, we only have 6.25% of our DNA. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so what happens is by the time you get to your great great grandparents, it's, it's starting to really dilute. Um, and so that's why um, uh, it makes it, um, you know, you could only go back about four or five generations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question? Oh, sorry. Uh, great, pre great program, Marie. Um, Thank you. I, I'd like to do some, I do research for horological things, but you want to find out things on people. You mentioned a couple of websites. You mentioned something about, um, the earlier in talk about looking up um, marriage records, and I'm not sure which one you mentioned, but I didn't, didn't write it down. They're on, uh, marriage records for Massachusetts are on the family search. Um, I'm, not, I'm talking, not, not Massachusetts, just saying in general, not just Massachusetts, just say in general. Yeah, uh, so, well, every, st unfortunately, uh, they're organized by states. By state, uh, okay. And so there's no national uh, database. Okay. Uh, but, but it is well worthwhile looking because many of the state vital records are on Ancestry.com and also FamilySearch.org. These, I should mention, um, and with their, uh, the uh, website addresses are on the syllabus. Okay, I use um, I use Ancestry pretty pretty heavily. It's pretty decent. You gotta be careful, like census yeah. has a lot of mistakes and everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know, so because like New York uh, can be problematic. Um, some states are very good. Ohio is very good. Um, I've had good luck with Minnesota and Michigan. California can be good, but the problem is for a lot of states is when did they start collecting vital records? Right. Um, and so for a lot of them, they didn't start until much later. Um, so, so, so family search, you, yeah. So, so family like search. When, you, when you're looking for uh, early settlers in California, for instance, you're going to have a lot of uh, problems. So familysearch.org is, is another good site then you like. Yeah, it. yeah. Familysearch.org does not require um, a, a subscription. That's the the Mormon, the Family History Library okay. in Salt Lake City, their okay. website. Okay. Ancestry, uh, you do have to pay something like $300 a, a year for uh, a, a subscription. So, well, I know our library, I live in Michigan. Our library has, you can go online and yeah, use the and library. Yeah, and Public Library also has a subscription to Ancestry. Mm -hmm. So you can go, you can't get it um, from your home computer through the library but you could go to the library and use one of their computers uh, to access it. And we can do it online because of COVID and everything. So, so yeah. thank what you so the, much. What is the best way to store information online? And once you've done a lot of research and you've established your tree line, so on, um, that's where I'm at. I'm not sure. Okay. Not so <laughs> yeah, I do it two different ways. Well, first of all, I have a program called Family Tree Maker. And I store my research um, on my computer. And of course I back up my computer as well um, uh, on my home computer. However, many people, including myself, have family trees on ancestry.com because I have a subscription with them. That yeah. being said, um, I have stopped making all my research because I've I've researched all of my ancestors, my eight great grand uh, great great grandparents, sixteen great great grandparents, 
and m most of their descendants. And so what happens is if you make that tree public online, people will first of all, steal your information. Um, and that may be okay with you. But what I found was that someone had taken, for instance, the dead infant brother of my grandfather and claimed him as their ancestor um, and given him a marriage and life, et cetera. And so once you put it out there, you can't control what errors people are gonna make with that. So what I do is I actually have two uh, family trees on ancestry. One, my full family tree, I made private. And I have a public family tree in which I only have the bare bones, my, uh, grandpa my direct lines, my grandparents, great grandparents, et cetera. Nice. So that's, that's my suggestion. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons why you wanna keep it on your, uh, your home computer also is that who knows what, you know, some of these companies, well, first of all, they could jack up their rates to a, a you know, unreasonable amount, or they could suddenly decide that it isn't in their business model to have online records anymore, and they're just going to shut it all down. And boom, you have lost everything. So, um, and the other thing that people are having issues with, with Ancestry is, a lot of people were posting like their family photos, you know, connected with their family trees, et cetera. And Ancestry changed their privacy rules to say that any of those, all of those images that are posted online are their property as well. And they could do whatever they want with them. So, uh, you know, a lot of people have objections about that. Um, so, uh, so a lot of people took down their family photos as well. Okay, thank you. Now, I have a question that sort of trails off of that. Uh, in Ancestry, when you've taken a DNA test, don't you need a public tree to attach the DNA test to so that you can take full advantage of the, the, the uh, matches and the options? You know, not everybody has a public tree attached. And some people, it's really kind of frustrating, have only three people themselves and their parents in that family tree. I see that a lot. And so what I, with, with me, what I attach um, is the, uh, the bare bones um, family tree, which I made public. Um, and, uh, but that being said, you know, I'm really a good sleuth. So, I, so one of the things, what happens is you get these DNA matches and you're thinking, who are these people? So, and then I have to start uh, researching, you know, and try to figure out who they are. And, um, and you, you could kind of say, look at them and say, well, it says that this person is my second or third cousin. Um, and uh, so I did that very recently. And what I found was he was the grandson of my first cousin, Sonny, who lived in Waltham. And this person actually lives in Waltham. So, uh, but the other thing I discovered was, so this is where the DNA has helped me. My great grandfather was Matthew Daly and he came to Belmont um, in 1851. Um, and his brother also came with him and his two brothers. So one of them was Dennis Daly and Dennis uh, died in 1855. So he didn't live very long. And the death record said that he was not married. So I never looked for any descendants of De uh, Dennis. So when I saw these matches and I'm trying to figure out who they are and I see that one of them has a family tree and it goes back to Dennis. So I went back and started researching Dennis and sure enough, I found his marriage record and I found that he had two children before he died, two male children before he died. So I then had, you know, this is when genealogists, you, what you'll see lights on on people's houses. Those are genealogists at two o'clock in the morning are sitting up, falling down rabbit holes, looking for their ancestors. So. And what I discovered was a very cool thing is that among 
the descendants of Dennis, was um, a pitcher for the Brooklyn Dodgers. So uh, yeah, so it's pretty cool. Uh, can I ask one more question? Sure. <clears throat> okay, um, so I'm not sure when this is supposed to end. I caught um, a real sizable amount of documents. So apparently my mother is French Canadian. So uh, we're talking about uh, ancestors from uh, Quebec and Nova Scotia. And somewhere along the line, someone, I think it was a reverend who was in the family tree line, acquired all this information before the internet happened, right? So it's all this documentation and it's just sizable. Um, I suppose I need to digital digitalize it, if I can say that right. And yeah. I wasn't sure about that, yeah. Yeah, I would suggest, um, yes, uh, digitizing them and storing them and perhaps sharing them with your relatives as well. Um, some of them can, may be able to add uh, information, um, but I also suggest to everyone that you digitize your family photos and your family documents um, and then back up those digital records, you know, whether it be in the cloud, on thumb drives, um, give, thumb drives to your uh, relatives so that you have offsite records. So in case something happens, a, 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 a burglar breaks into your house and steals your computer, which I always live in fear of, so that you want to be able to, uh, to save all of the, these records. And um, so, yes, uh, uh, and the other thing is you wanna properly preserve them. Um, and so you want to, if they are paper records, um, say they're uh, letters that are folded up, you want to carefully unfold them and you want to put them in acid-free um, folders. And uh, you can order acid-free folders online. I'm trying to think of uh, what the name is. Gaylord Brothers uh, is a... Uh, a website at a company that a lot of libraries use to order their archival storage um, information. I also have some of these records in archival boxes. Um, for instance, I have my mother's um, first communion record from St. John's Church in North Cambridge. And it's huge, it's beautiful, but it's huge. And I was able to order from Gaylord uh, a, a flat uh, archival storage box uh, to store these records in. So, um, so I, I suggest uh, you do that. I think there was another, was another website actually in the local area in Cambridge. I think that I got the archival storage from. You need to kind of like Google it and do some research on that. Okay, thank you. And I can also throw in from my own experience that if you don't have a scanner, printer scanner at home, uh, all of our smartphones actually have scanning abilities. Uh, yeah. If you have an iPhone, it's it's buried in the, I think, the notes app or the photo app. There's actually a scanner function, but the uh, uh, Android Google phones, you can download uh, scanner apps for them. And they work pretty well. I've used them. Uh, yeah, I used, um, and when I was researching the uh, uh, 1918 flu epidemic, I found that there were records of the Waltham Visiting Nurses Association or district nurses in the archives of the Waltham Public Library. And there were, these were wonderful records. And I was able to use that notes function, which will actually do a PDF record of uh, the, th because these weren't images, these were uh, written records. And so I was able to actually uh, make copies of them as PDF files on my phone. And then you would what, upload them on your computer and put them in That's the That's right, yep, yep. So okay. then what I do is I usually just mail them to myself, um, you know, you, a, a, as attachments to myself and then uh, download them on my computer. That's the easiest way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Ju Judith, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> I um, 
you know, you just mentioned about the, the 1918 flu epidemic. My mother was the youngest of 13 children, didn't have me till she was in her 40s. And um, she had one of the siblings um, was her favorite brother, Paul, and he died in that epidemic. My mother's long dead, all the aunts and uncles and everything. How could I investigate anything about where he's buried or it, he well, was from, from the the so, so what state uh, did they die in? Massachusetts. He okay, was from so, the, so in Massachusetts, the death records from 1918 are yeah. on family, they're on family Okay. And they give you the place of burial on the death record. Okay, familysearch.com. Great, thank you. You know, another thing you, you were mentioning about uh, the military records of people. And one thing, I, when I was looking up, you know, my Uncle Paul, the dead guy, a uh, long time ago, this is a small thing, but it really touched me. I have sort of gray eyes and on that military record, it said his eye color was gray. And it just really, yeah. did. oh, it's this tiny thing, but um, anyway. I found that with my, uh, my great grandfather was in the civil war um, yeah. and Matthew Daly. And, mm -hmm. you know, of course we don't, first of all, we don't have any pictures of him, but even mm -hmm. if we did, they'd be in black and white. So, mm -hmm. but the military uh, record, the, the mustering in roll mentioned mm -hmm. that he had blue eyes and brown hair. Um, mm -hmm. so, and this is because, you know, the military wants to be able to identify bodies. Uh, so they uh, want yeah. some sort of a description. Yeah. Nowadays, the military takes DNA. So, so if mm -hmm. you're, I use this argument with my brother when he, he, he when I asked him if he would do DNA for the Y DNA test, mm. uh, he, he didn't want the government getting his DNA. So I said to my nephew, Walter, who was in the Navy, I said, Walter, did the Navy take your DNA when you joined? And he said, yes. So I said, mm. well, the government already has our DNA. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Of course. It's, it's hard to stay private anymore, isn't it? No. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> well, they also have found now there are companies out there that could get uh, DNA from postage stamps. Um, oh, so, okay. But of course, nowadays, when you get postage stamps, you get the ones that you can peel off so you don't have to lick them anymore. But they're mm -hmm. able actually to take like old envelopes, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. some of them, and uh, to analyze the DNA on them. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. I, 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 well, this is really fascinating stuff, Marie. Um, yeah. Even though I, I haven't dabbled into this too much of late, it actually caused a big, you mentioned the Y DNA caused kind of a big flap in my family. I, my brothers, um, you know, my father's father and mother are dead. My brothers are long gone and have been out of touch for 20 years. And, um, and I don't know any cousins, aunts, uncles, etc. And I, I'm 70. I would love to, in my lifetime, um, discover any, any relatives. So you know, I get the picture from what Marie's saying that, you know, through DNA, I may be Yeah, I would to... suggest for you that you start off with Ancestry. So yeah. Ancestry DNA uh, uh, database uh, includes is 20 million now. So oh. it is the largest database. Um, so, so that's one where you're mm -hmm. likely to get, and that would be an autosomal test. Uh, uh -huh. And that's the one that you would likely to get the most hits. Right. That being said, so I've actually, uh, because I'm into genealogy, obviously in a big way, yeah. but I've I've uh, tested with family tree DNA for the Y mm -hmm. and autosomal, yeah. and also ancestry because the companies use different algorithms. Also, mm -hmm. so you may actually get different results from different companies as well. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So I've also uploaded my, for free, my DNA to GEDmatch and also mm -hmm. to myheritage.com. And when I did GEDmatch, I got an email from people in Ireland who said <laughs> that they, they had this uh, relative who lived on the ancestral Darcy family homestead in Kilkenny. Mm -hmm. And I actually had uh, a third to fourth cousin match with this man um, in Ireland. Um, and I knew that my ancestors came from Kilkenny, but I didn't know exactly where. And so oh. I was then able to actually locate where my Darcy's came from in Kilkenny. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, uh, I use um, GEDmatch and family, uh, myheritage.com to right. what they call triangulate uh, your ancestors. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So you've, got, you've got these people that you match and uh -huh. you start looking at who are their matches. Um, yeah. And then you see, oh, there's my cousin, Donnie Kelly who matches mm -hmm. this person also. So mm -hmm. we must have the same chromosomes in common. Mm -hmm. And so you are then able to actually look to see what chromosomes are the, the Kelly chromosomes. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so anyway, so the yes, DNA could be enormously um, uh, interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, you have to know how to use it. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I should mention that that Roots Tech will probably have huge numbers of DNA lectures available. Mm -hmm. So I suggest mm -hmm. signing up for some of those. Roots Tech. Okay. Yeah, the Roots Tech that I showed on my slide. Yeah. So yeah. if you Google Roots Tech 2022, you'll come oh, up okay. with uh, automatically on Google, um, and you could sign up right now for it. Mm -hmm. so. so you also mentioned that um, eh, the census for 2021 is coming out soon. Is that what you said? No, two, 2022. It's in March, this March. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Less than two, two, eight weeks from now. <laughs> Um, that, yeah. that will be the 1950 yeah. census that will yeah. be released. There's a delay. Yeah. <clears throat> what is it? 72 year delay on yeah. releasing the cens federal censuses. Wow. Yep. So um, as of now, we have access to up to 1940, but right. next uh -huh. year we will all get to see 1950. Yep. Okay. Okay. Cool. That'll be cool because you know we moved to Waltham in 1950, so I'm not sure. If mm -hmm. I'm going to be, if we're going to be listed in Waltham or Belmont, it depends on mm -hmm. what time of year they took the census. Because mm -hmm. then you moved to Waltham. Yeah, so, from yeah, Belmont. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marie, yeah. have you used the state census at all? I found it yeah. helpful uh, to, I, in the 1855 state census. Yeah, for Massachusetts, there are two state, state census records. 1855 mm -hmm. and 1865. Mm -hmm. And again, these can help you in the in-between years. For instance, a lot of, hi Connie, <laughs> uh, a lot of uh, Irish immigrants came in the, the period right after 1850. So they're not gonna be in the 1850 census, but you could may be able to pick them up in 1855. The mm -hmm. other thing is, you know, there was a high death rate. The infant mortality rate mm -hmm. in uh, in the pre-1850 Boston was 20%. So what mm -hmm. happens is in some of these state census records, you may pick up children that died, you mm -hmm. know, in, in the in-between years. And so that you might know, had never known about. So, mm -hmm. and that's why I also mm -hmm. suggest going through church records. Um, because the church records may pick up children uh, who were mm -hmm. who uh, were baptized but died as as children uh, before mm -hmm. they appeared in any records. So you know how um, in Dorchester there's the parishes they're well known for their they identify by what parish yes. you're from. Yeah. Uh, 
And when I tried doing some, actually I hired someone to do some genealogy about a dozen years ago and they couldn't get all the information they were hunting for because there'd been maybe a fire. In uh, okay, so one of the things somewhere. you wanna watch out for. Well, first of all, don't pester the priests in uh, when you go to visit. Never priests. would I pester a priest. Saying that you're in <laughs> So because, first of all, so one of the things, they don't know where these records are. Oh, no, first yeah. of all, the archdiocese no, has they're collected not paid them genealogist. All. Right. <laughs> they, the archdiocese collected them all into the yeah. uh, the archives. And the priests mm -hmm. have been shifted around, so they have no idea where yeah. the parish yeah. registers are. And so yeah. they got to come up with some story about why they're not there. So they say they were burnt in a fire. It was a fire. Yeah. And I, the I had people was come in to uh, the Hisgen, and yeah. they would say that they went to the parish uh, church in Galway, and the priest mm -hmm. said that the records were burned in a fire. And I thought, yeah, I don't think so, because actually the Family History Library microfilmed the records, and those are available online. So, uh, I've uh, read that. I've read that also <laughs> in regards to my own tree line. Yeah. Uh -huh. found something and it was noted, oh, there was a fire. And, yeah. was a fire. And, and not only that, so priests are not the only ones that are guilty yeah. of this. Town clerks yeah. can do that. And yeah. what they'll, so what happens is somebody will go into like the, the uh, uh, you know, Berkeley, Massachusetts re uh, town hall and say mm -hmm. they want to look at the, the, a record from 1650 and the town clerk is thinking those records are down in the basement and it's all mm -hmm. dark and, and there's spiders everywhere down there right. and I do not want to go down and get those. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Oh, and, wait, uh, wasn't... so they'll make up again about the fire. Occasionally the there were real fires. We didn't St. Mary's and Waltham actually have a fire and, and records burned? Uh, they did, but the records weren't burnt. Uh, what mm -hmm. I found, first of all, was that, so there's this infamous priest, Father James Strain in Waltham, and, and he wanted to build the rectory in the church parking lot. And uh, as it turns out, the, the, the parish did not want him to do that because they would have no place to, to uh, park their uh, carriages and horses. And the, the, the church then mysteriously burned down. But what I did find was, uh, first of all, some of the early Waltham records are in St. Peter's Re of Cambridge Parish Register. And the reason is, I think that he had just started, there was only a few pages that were used in this Paris Register. So I think they decided to like recycle it and bring it over to St. Peter's. But mm. also Waltham, the Waltham uh, St. Mary's records are online on um, AmericanAncestors.org. And those go mm -hmm. back to the 1840s also. Mm -hmm. So um, so anyways, but at, uh, I should say that I found some interesting information about uh, Father James Strain and also Michael Rogers. And how I got on to Michael Rogers was because we had on the Waltham Historical Commission, we had a demolition request for his house on South Street. And when I started looking into this guy, I found that he was he may have been quite a shady character. And he owned this house um, on Main Street near uh, Massasoit Street, across from like Linden Street. And this house, the paper reported that it burned down and that there was a considerable amount of insurance on it. And they were implying mm -hmm. that it had been burned down for the insurance. However, we discovered that there was a relationship between Father Strain and Michael Rogers and that they owned this mm -hmm. house and the ownership went back and forth between Father Strain, his brother Peter, and Michael Rogers. And the other thing is that Michael Rogers, who, who is, was a known arsonist, 
um, also was the leader of the uh, the anti Father Strain faction in St. Mary's. So that that there's in other words, there's quite a bit of circumstantial evidence now that points to perhaps Michael Rogers as the uh, the person that burned that set St. Mary's on fire. So there's a lot more to the story. It's a very long story, but you should um, you should write that out for the yeah. society, Marie, because that's some amazing yeah. detective work on your part there. <laughs> so <laughs> and, and then of course I know the, the 1890 federal census burned as well. That yeah. there, a good portion of that is missing. And I've learned about using substitutions and other records. Yeah. Sometimes state censuses or, you know. You know what Waltham has, which is a very uh, useful record, are uh, what they call the annual listings. And back when some of you may remember, because it didn't stop until the 1960s, there were poll taxes and you had to pay a poll tax in order to vote. And so these uh, records of the poll taxes were compiled in books called annual listings in Waltham. These have been digitized back to 1891, um, and they are on the Waltham Public Library website. So say you're interested in who owned your house before you lived in it. You can go to that address in the annual listing to see who was living in it, uh, in your house. Um, and uh, so we, I use that uh, all the time. Um, and of course they have it for every day. year. Pardon? I, I used it yesterday uh, ah. through through DNA. I've connected with someone uh, who uh, seems to be connected into my family through the Burks, and they they mentioned uh, that their grandmother's naturalization papers were signed by a William Burke. And I remember from family law there being a, a Willie Burke that my older brothers and sisters, my mother would send them down bring some food to Willie Burke who was some relative of my grandmother's and um, the, the, the family her family was Davik well wouldn't you know I looked in the in the Waltham uh, street listings and I found Willie Burke at 81 Pine Street and I found the Daviks at 81 Pine Street wow so yeah so there were Burks, of course, galore all over Waltham. Um, yeah, I, so, I have Burks in, because... in my Waltham tree as well. <laughs> I have Mary Burke, yeah, in my, born in eighteen twenty-five in Ireland and died in eighteen ninety-three in Waltham. So, well, there was a major cluster of people from County Galway in Waltham. Um, so, what happens is some early immigrants will come to town and they'll start working. And maybe one of them gets to be the foreman of like the bleachery. And so what happens is they write back and say, come on over and go see John <laughs> Cooley at the bleachery and he will give you, a, he'll get you a job. Um, so you start getting, so major clusters of people from certain places in the United States. And there were, uh, for instance, a, a cluster of people from Lewisburg County Mayo in Clinton. There were people from uh, the Inishowan Peninsula in Donegal, in Woburn. Um, so like the most common name in Woburn is Doherty. Um, mm -hmm. So, and of course in Waltham, the most common name now is LeBlanc. But you also have to look and see, well, yes, but where are the LeBlancs coming from and are they related? Um, and so they, and they most likely are, um, so. What Same thing that? for the Italians. So, you know, there was a major cluster of people from Aragona, Sicily, and they settled in the Felton Street, Charles Street area. Um, so, uh, so it's not surprising if you have a, an Italian ancestor and they're living on Felton Street and you don't know where they're from, you might want to consider Aragona as their origin. Um, so it's not proof, but it gives you a place then to look for them. What was that name you mentioned at the at the um, bleachery? Cooley. 
Did you say Cooley? Cool. Yeah. The so I did a talk on uh, researching Irish maids, uh, and huh. I traced an Irish maid who worked for uh, her name was oh I'll think of, Laffy Bridget Laffy, and she worked for the Emersons at fifteen. Uh, Lyman Street. And uh, so she marries John Cooley. Uh, and he is the he was the um, the uh, superintendent or the, the no foreman um, at the bleachery. And um, so uh, so anyways, John Cooley was from Galway, as was Bridget Laffey. Um, and what I did find and how I was able to determine where she came from was I started looking around and saying, well, are there other Laffies in Waltham? That's not such a common name. Yes, it turns out she had three sisters living in Waltham. Hmm. And I was able to do this by looking at the vital records and doing a search for the names of her parents and then seeing, well, who else has the same parents? Then once I found that uh, her sisters, I was able to go on the Irish parish register uh, websites and do a search for their baptisms um, and come up with an exact birthplace for Bridget Laffey. So, so anyways, yes. Uh, so, so, you know, you always have to start looking around at the friends and families of all of these people. Um, for instance, on the, those Conleys, they mentioned that the mother's name was Dyer, Anne Dyer, and they were from Ireland. And you have to consider in Ireland that an Irishman did not go very far to find a bride. They usually are in the, the immediate vicinity, if not next door, okay? So, um, so if you are a Dyer from South Boston and you see this, obituary of a uh, of Gregory of uh, Stephen Conley in Beverly and it mentions that he's related and that his mother's name his his wife's name is Dyer then you say well oh, my Dyers may come from the same place that Stephen Conley comes from so I there's my clue as to where the Dyers come from mm -hmm. interesting so Bob, I know, how are you doing with your family search? I, you've been able to get your family back to Galway also. Yeah, um, um, all, all roads lead to Galway. I, I think every one of my lines traces back to Athenry. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, right now I'm, I'm going around and around because of this, this again, this woman that I con got made contact with because of the DNA. And we're just hitting one of those things where she, she's got a Mary Burke in, in, uh, in her ancestry. And I've got a couple of Mary Burks, but they don't seem to be the same Mary Burke. And we're thinking yeah. maybe, there's an, you know, maybe there's another Mary Burke in there somewhere. Well, you also have to look at, at how much DNA do you share and whether your common ancestor is actually another one or two generations back. So because it could if be. You, once you get down below like 12 or 13 centimeter centimorgans of uh, match, then it's becoming, it's going back into the mists of time where you may not be able to identify that. That's what happened with this Pat Darcy that I match in Kilkenny. We don't know exactly who the common ancestor is because it's a generation beyond what the parish registers uh, show, so. 